Jedi rather was um, and five, I think it would have been with the inaugural meeting with Edmund Poot. I seem yeah. to remember. So was that 2005? It seems like a very long time ago now. Um, so my uh, experience in the industry, I've been in the industry for 34 years. Uh, I was one of the people who worked uh, on the original concept of Wish in 2000 um, to get people together uh, who have a shared interest in improving health, safety and well-being in the waste sector. Um, that's grown into something entirely different. We now, as you know, um, prepare documents which are, are could prove codes of practice with the HSE um, uh, and the standards, it's helped set the standards, I guess, that the industry uh, works to. Uh, I've operated waste plants. I've been, a, I've done it at the sharp end. Uh, I've, I've worked with collection activities and so on. Um, so uh, I'd like to think um, that I know the difference between ivory towerism and um, boots on the ground. And much of what we try to do at WISH is to uh, really extract from people what best practice looks like. We won't write into guidance anything which isn't being done practically somewhere economically by somebody. It's far too easy to set silly standards that actually aren't practically achievable and that's not what we're about. Um, wish you may or may not know some of the standards that wish rights like the fire standards are now used on three continents uh, and have been translated into many languages. Um, I'm very proud of that and I know that my colleagues at wish are but actually our pride stems from the fact that all of you get together and help us prepare those documents. It's not us that do this, it's the power of your collective uh, thoughts. So what I'm going to just do is now share my screen. I hope this is going to work perfectly well. I've got about 15 slides I'm going to rush through quite quickly. Um, we can talk about any of them. At the end, I've tried to be a little bit provocative. I'll get, I'll, that was easy for me to say. Um, just to get some, um, I guess, some discussion going. So um, you'll forgive me for that. This is a bit of a, an update of what Wish is doing. And also we'll look at um, uh, some of the accidents that have been this year. Just. OK, so 20 minutes or so, I hope maybe a bit less. We look at the accident rates. One of the questions I'm always asked about is how bad our accident rates are. The, when on a good year like last year, the press say, oh, you've had a really good year. You only had one fatality. Yeah, that's not a great measure of fatalities. And now this year, of course, we've had nine and oh, it's a terrible year. Well, the truth is things go up and down. So we'll have a little look at what the accident rates do and don't tell us about what's going on in the sector. I'll look at the nine fatals this year and uh, and draw the lessons. There are no new lessons. All of these things are known. Um, we'll look at some machinery safety issues associated with vehicles, which I believe will be affecting vehicles in Northern Ireland just as much as they are vehicles in England and Wales. Um, I'll give you some feedback from the HSE's England and Wales intervention programme. I know that um, HSE and I are doing something similar currently uh, and just really a very brief look at the WISH programme of work. All right, fatal accident stats and accident stats. If we go back to 2003-04, um, this was published um, bringing out the point that actually the waste sector was awful, frankly, 40 times worse than the national average uh, with fatality rates uh, that were 10 times worse than deep sea fishing. And that takes some doing. We're not there now at all. If we look at the accident data over the last um, 20 years, actually the accident initiative that um, uh, WISH set up in 2003 with ESA has had a massive impact. We set ourselves the task of 10% reduction year on year in riddles, riddles being major injuries, anything over seven days or broken bones. Uh, and actually, we, we've achieved better than that in the UK. Uh, we've uh, The reduction is 12% year on year, more than 90% lower today than it was in 20, 2003. So when we're busy getting beaten up by how poor we are as a sector, let's actually put that into perspective. You all, we all have done incredibly well over the last 20 years. However, we are still way above um, our comparators in uh, construction, agriculture uh, uh, and uh, manufacturing. The one question I do have to ask is we've been fascinated and fixated with riddle rates and fatality rates for 20 years. And have we not now got to the stage where we've reduced them to the point where we should maybe looking at instead of these reactive measures, 
we should be looking at more proactive measures. How much effort are we making to reduce these accidents rather than just measuring when it goes wrong? Things that can actually bring about a change. Okay, yeah, those of you who are in the public sector, this is um, drawn from HSE stats. Uh, and one point that uh, we are focusing on a little bit, although the public sector makes up 30% of the employment waste and recycling in the UK, actually it contributes 44% of RIDOR. Why is that? What is it that could be done actually so that we are all on a common playing field? So that's just a, you know, just a simple look at some of the statistics and I'm happy to talk to any of those a bit more as we go on. I'm going to look now for, uh, through the nine fatals that they've been this year. Like I said, uh, the press are very keen and regularly um, so oh, it's a good year or a bad year. Measuring fatals is a very, very poor way of measuring performance. The industry has improved over the last 20 years. The fatal accident rate, however, is not uh, not not improved by nearly as much. It was an average of around 11 per year <clears throat> in 2003. The five year rolling average is currently five. But the difficulty there is you have things like the um, Glasgow George Street incident in 2015 in there, which contributes 20 in one year that distort the statistics. And you've got such small numbers uh, that actually it can quickly look quite poor. So the nine that there are this year now, I am working from publicly available sources. I will say up front, we work, which works closely with the HSE. I know more than is in the publicly available sources, but these are all under active investigation by enforcing authorities. And so we have to be incredibly careful about what we do and don't say. Um, Wish works with HSE so that we can get the message out to the industry as quickly as possible after fatal accidents. Um, so that people can know what it is that they can do to stop the next one happening. Um, if you read about a fatal accident in the waste sector and you want to know whether there are any lessons to be drawn, then please contact us uh, because we're more than happy uh, to pass that information on. But you do need to understand and respect that actually what we can say is often limited by the um, enforcement uh, agencies for good reason. So uh, back in January, there was a, a small tyre recycling facility operating on a, a farm in Anglesey. We understand that the, uh, that a worker there had a tipper bodied vehicle, a small tipper bodied vehicle. Um, he was tipping a load of tyres um, and it would appear that he stood far too close to the tailgate when the tipping was taking place. The gate, the tailgate, either wasn't fastened back or came back as part of the tipping operation, struck him on the head and killed him. We frequently in the waste sector have cage vehicles with swinging doors that tip at transfer stations and elsewhere. Um, it's an important lesson to us to ensure that people are not near the rear of the vehicle when the tipping activity takes place. Um, if you want to look for some more guidance on that, look at Waste 09. Uh, which has information on that. I'll mention waste uh, documents and info documents as I go through. They're all available for free on the WISH website. So um, accident number two, which probably has got more attention, uh, work was fatally injured while undertaking domestic waste collections in Coventry. He approached the rear of the vehicle, became entangled in an automatic bin lift, ended up in the hopper and was crushed by the packer plate. Um, I'm going to talk a bit more about that one later. Automatic bin lifts have been responsible for three fatalities in the last 11 years and uh, an unknown number of serious injuries. Um, but we have, uh, there is a serious issue uh, with uh, currently equipped bin lifts that have an automatic feature on <laughs> RTVs. And I'll address that as a se there's a separate slide on that in a, bit, in a little bit. Uh, accident number three. Uh, a fitter was working on the base of the mast of a forklift truck. It had a heavy attachment on it for rotating um, drums, I think. And um, he did something to the hydraulics and then that resulted in the attachment and the load falling on him. Uh, you might argue it's not strictly a waste industry accident, and I might not disagree with you. Um, it could happen anywhere where they operate forklift trucks. This happens to be a waste facility, and so it's gone down as a waste fatality. 
up in Perth, uh, in Scotland, a large propane cylinder had been concealed in um, a container, a, a roll-on container of um, small electrical appliances that was delivered to a wee recycling facility from a HWRC. How it came to be in there isn't known. Uh, unfortunately, the propane cylinder they went, went, then went through we a wee sorting and shredding facility and exploded, killing a nearby operative. Um, gas cylinders are a, an issue, and in particular, probably you may be aware there has been an explosion, no pun intended, in the numbers of N2O cylinders that we're finding in all sorts of places. 600 gram and two kilo N2O cylinders are now appearing in all so it, it, very widely in street cleansing, arisings, in waste arisings and so on. And um, some of these pressurized to 10,000 PSI uh, and have a serious potential. Uh, the next one I'm gonna move on to is uh, Old Brie. Um, this is a sorting operation where construction waste was tipped on the floor and then a bunch of guys would hand sort it in collaboration with a front loading shovel, which would help to spread it out and so on. Um, there is a specific waste guidance note on that, waste 11, um, which is would be worth looking up if you do that kind of work. They did not ensure adequate separation, it would appear, and somebody was killed by a front loading shovel by being struck by the front loading shovel. Uh, at Tameside in um, in May, uh, an individual was attempting to recycle a fire extinguisher, which was still fully pressurized. Um, uh, he, as I understand it, he was attempting to cut the valve off when it exploded and killed him. Um, that's more a scrap metal um, accident as much as anything else but again it falls under waste and recycling and that's one that we're picking up with BMRA which is the British Metals Recycling Association. In April um, an individual uh, Murph in London struck was struck by the underside of a conveyor. Um, this individual had entered an area which should have been locked off but wasn't. The belly pads have been taken off the conveyor for good reasons to do with presenting waste buildup and fire. Um, there was an area where if you got down on your hands and knees and crawled, you could get under the guard. And that's what it disappears. This individual did um, and struck his head and was killed. And the message there is about machinery guarding and Jim and I are having a short conversation about this earlier. The idea of safe by position really simply doesn't work. You need to guard things fully. And whilst there may be good reasons why you need to take guards off and fire in MERS is one of them, you then need to put in adequate safety provisions to ensure that actually people can't. People do the most extraordinary things on occasions and just assuming that nobody's going to crawl under a guard is not a safe thing to do. In Bradford quite recently, um, an individual was crossing a um, transport depot where it's a collection activity. Um, he was wearing ear pods or headphones, not quite clear which. A reversing RCV driver um, was only using one mirror for whatever reasons, did not see the individual who was crossing the yard. The individual was not crossing the yard on the marked footpath, he was taking a shortcut and between the driver's inattention and the um, inability of the individual who was crossing the yard to hear what was going on around him because of the earbuds, um, he was struck and killed. And last and most bizarrely, at Scalby in um, North Yorkshire, an individual was found one morning, a member of the public, trapped in a clothing bank, and he died of asphyxiation at some point in time. The assumption is that he was attempting to remove clothing from the bank, um, but n that's not at all clear. It's gone down as a uh, waste accident. We do have a specific waste guidance note on the safety of bring banks and so on. That's waste 13. But it appears that everything there was as it should be. Um, there's a police investigation to work out exactly how he managed to die. Um, but this is reminiscent of some accidents that occurred in the very early noughties where people were trying to scavenge materials that were felt to have value from bring bins. 
uh, and there were fatalities, including of children who were passed into the banks. Um, so it may be that that's sim this one's similar. None of those are particularly different to any of the accidents that I'm aware of over the last 30 years. As usual, workplace transport um, plays a big part. Entanglement and machinery accidents we are seeing increasingly. Once upon a time, um, workplace transport was the big killer. Um, and for every accident of another kind, there would be three in workplace transport. Currently, it's about even between workplace transport and machinery entanglement. And that's because obviously with the increase in recycling, we're using more machinery. So that brings me on to machinery on vehicles. Um, this slide probably you, you're going to struggle to see the top path, but I will explain it. And um, if we have time and, and opportunity, I may show you the, the original video. It's come to uh, light partly through the Coventry accident, but partly through other investigations that we've done, that there are some serious issues with the machinery on the back of vehicles. Certainly uh, my view, and this is a personal opinion, uh, is that machinery manufacturers are far too quick to say, oh, it's on the back of a vehicle and I can't put guards around it, um, and far too slow to figure out how to make those machines safe. So in the in the case of automatic bin lifters, and I draw your attention to the, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but hopefully you can, the top uh, right-hand picture, which is not a particularly good picture, I mean, it's from a CCTV. What's happened there is an individual has approached an automatic bin lift, which is in the automatic mode, to throw waste into the hopper over the rave rail. As he has done so, his foot has hit the base plate and his chest has brushed the push plate that the bin would normally contact. That means he's closed the contacts uh, in the bin lift. As far as the bin lift's concerned, there's a bin there. The clamp has come down, grabbed him by the coat, and he throws him in the back. He was lucky. One, his colleague came to his aid, and two, the packing cycle wasn't on automatic. So he was able to climb out of, uh, of the hopper. We know that there are at least three other deaths, sorry, two other deaths, three in total, that are associated with individuals being grabbed by the auto bin lift and chucked into the hopper. But we also know that there are individual there are instances of, for example, members of the public thinking that they've missed the opportunity to have their waste collected, running up to the back of the vehicle, leaning over and throwing things in. The bin lift is activated, it grabs them, throws them in the back. Now, if this piece of machinery was in a factory, then it was likely to grab passers by and throw them into a compactor. It would have all sorts of guards and wards around it. But because it's on the back of a truck, it has nothing. Uh, Wish is currently engaged with the truck manufacturers, uh, with HSE, um, uh, and we intend to address this point. We put out a position statement on this um, back in uh, March, uh, really drawing attention to the guidance that's already in place about the use of automatic bin lifts uh, and about um, the precautions that need to be taken. The fact is, at the moment, the only thing we can do are procedural type precautions, training, monitoring, making sure people don't get too close to them while they're in the live automatic mode. Um, the reality, however, is I think all of us believe that in the 21st century, it should be not beyond the wit of engineers to tell the difference between a bin and a man on the bin lift. We have um, currently in the industry a number of uh, projects being where they're using AI on CCTV to predict unsafe behaviour, and they're actually doing it very successfully. Well, if they can do that, they must be able to tell the difference between a man and a bin approaching the back of that bin lift. Um, and we're putting a lot of pressure on them to sort that problem. Associated with that as well is this bottom picture. So this is what's often called a mini freighter. It's um, a seven and a half ton uh, vehicle, that looks a lot like an RCV, and they share one common feature, and that is that the controls to operate the bin lifts are at the back of the vehicle, such that it's possible to operate the controls and entangle yourself in the lift. This gentleman in the picture is about to lose his thumb and two of his fingers. 
because he holds on to the bin far too long, the clamp comes down and cuts his digits off. <laughs> we did a quick survey amongst um, the WISH membership and what that revealed is we got in responses from 25 collection authority districts, 24 of them are using mini freighters. So my bet is that some or all of you are using mini freighters. And of those 105 vehicles have that problem. You can operate the controls and you can shove your hands in the mechanism. 12 collection districts had modified their vehicles, just over half. Three were relying on training, telling people not to shove their hands in the clamp. The others appear to have their fingers crossed and to be hoping wistfully that they're not among the organisations who end up with amputations and so on. Now, of those 25 organisations that reported to us, 10 of them gave us accident histories and we were horrified, absolutely horrified to discover um, that there were eight cases of amputations and multiple cases of people having hands crushed and suffering long term injuries. It's avoidable. The buttons just need to be placed. The operating controls need to be placed so far forward that the individual cannot reach. Um, and actually, the vehicles that have been modified, that's exactly what's been done. All they've done is move the controls forward so that you can't put your hands in the um, mechanism while you're operating the controls. Uh, the alternative is you could put a two hand control, one of these things that you have to push from both ends, which would have the same objective. So this is something we're also taking up with manufacturers. Um, but something I bring to your attention because it's a serious issue. Uh, so much for vehicle safety. Uh, I'll come back to that undoubtedly some people will ask some questions about that later and that's fine. HSC undertook an intervention. Um, so visit 500 and, uh, waste and recycling facilities was the target, looking specifically at wall safety following the collapse in Birmingham where the individuals were killed um, and uh, looking at workplace guarding uh, following the rise in entanglements and so on that we've seen. So they've ended up doing 565 inspections. 234 of those attracted fee for intervention. So that's a 41% breach rate. That really isn't great for an industry. They served 198 notices, 44 of which are prohibitions, 154 are improvements. And the two big ones were workplace transport and machinery guarding. Surprise, surprise. They make up the biggest numbers of fatalities. Uh, and I'll leave you to look at the numbers there. What I do find very concerning is that there were six improvement notices and 35 contraventions for inadequate welfare facilities. It's the 21st century, for God's sake. Can we really not provide decent wash basins and toilets? Um, I have to say, sadly, this is largely an unchanged picture from 2019, 2020, uh, when a, an exactly identical intervention took place, um, slightly different facilities, but with very similar outcomes. And so this is something that we're now working with HSE to work out how we can actually get the message across to people. Um, as I say, uh, getting across a simple message about welfare is one thing, but clearly if we can make a, a dent in those 198 notices so that more people have got better safety in terms of plant transport and guarding, uh, then we will have a clear impact on the serious injury rates. Right, our current program of work is long and so I'm going to spe but I'm going to speed through this. We've got some recently gu issued guidance. If you haven't looked at it, please do. Uh, practical isolation and lock off, dealing with isolation lock off for recycling facilities and the like. It's an area where we far too often see deaths. There are two or three deaths every year of people who climb into machines that have not been properly isolated. They to clear blockages most often. They restart uh, and the people involved uh, unfortunately are killed. Containment wall safety um, 32, which as I say was the subject of the intervention. An awful lot of people have push walls and containment walls which they have not properly thought through the engineering of. And unfortunately, when they fail, they will fail catastrophically. Um, and there's some really good guidance in that document, albeit a bit of a long one, which will help you uh, to make the right decisions and make your push walls safe. Keep them safe. Um, four info sheets, three of which are already out, belt conveyors, trommels and horizontal plane bailers. Those three 
work with Waste 33 and they're part of a larger suite. We're now working through doing special documents on a series of pieces of equipment that we know cause issues like balers uh, and shredders is the next one that will be up. Um, Bioaerosols one's not on the website yet. It has been approved. Uh, it'll probably be up by the end of the week, I should think. Three consultations. If you're interested, we'd love to have your comments. You can find them on the WISH website or you can contact me and I'll send them to you. Waste 23 on waste uh, recycling collection services. This is the one that brought in the concept of root risk assessments, asking people to do root risk assessments. It's been around um, originally from 2007. Um, we're in the process of revising it, bringing it up to date. Waste 26 on HWRCs. That's particularly looking at things like lithium batteries, EV batteries that we're starting to see turn up, um, nitrous oxide cylinders, um, and on general waste shredders. Uh, waste shredders are used quite widely. They've been the cause of a number of very serious accidents. And so we put together a, a sheet on just that. Um, so you can see the deadlines for response there. The shred is one, the deadline for response is actually today, but if you get something into me in the next week or so, I'll make sure that it um, gets added. Um, and all of these documents, and I'm not going to go through them one by one, uh, we will be consulting on by the end of, uh, by Easter next year, some of these by Christmas. There are some important ones I'll draw your attention to. Uh, we have a new guidance document on mental health that will be out soon. Uh, a really important area for the industry um, and one on supervisor competence, which I also think is a very important area for the industry. So on to my provocative thoughts, if you want to call them that. Uh, so much for the accidents, so much for the horror. What can we do about it? How do we move forward? Because that's actually the most important thing. I think we need more cooperation, engagement, better communication amongst all of the uh, all of those are involved. I think, it, you know, it's great that we're now forging better links with Wish NI and Wish UK um, and similarly with Switch in Scotland. Um, that can, uh, you know, that needs to be an important part in the way we go forward. We are certainly trying uh, in GB to uh, get better links with the unions so that we can get workforce contribution. They often know things about what's going on and practices and so on that we don't uh, and they're important, they're, their contribution is important. And I do think it's important uh, and there we have the start of it that HSE and operators get together on things like the equipment that we're getting from manufacturers so that we can actually get fit equipment when it arrives. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, we, we need to carry on building the best practice guidance series that we've been working on so that in collaboration we can all know what it what good looks like and then everybody can hopefully do that the whole idea as i said at the beginning is wish will only write into guidance things that somebody somewhere is doing economically and if we all can then reach that standard and each time somebody will have an innovation that will take us a bit further we can continue that improvement that i showed in the accident stats I, I do want to see us challenging some of the things that have been around in the industry forever. There is this feeling in the industry that you have to get the job done. Uh, waste can't be left on the streets. Well, research report 1128, which was undertaken in 2018 into fatalities in the waste industry, you can look it up. Um, the biggest single killer was loss of situational awareness associated with getting the job done. OK, it was the biggest factor in the fatalities that they looked at. Um, and so that's something we need to actually tackle with uh, our culture needs to be tackled. Actually, getting the job done shouldn't be at any cost. There should be things where we just stop and go, let's just think about this for a minute before we carry on. I don't think the industry is particularly good at managing change. You might disagree with me. But um, it's a very fast paced industry. We kind of accept the fact that we're adaptive and we tend to overcome things. It's a good trait, very positive, but actually we need to manage that. When people are finding better ways to do things or adapting, let's make sure we know that so that we can spread that good knowledge. And when they're about to make a change or do something adaptive, which is dangerous, we need to be able to intervene. 
uh, we need to move on from the command and control ethos. That's got us the kind of improvements you saw so far. And what I mean by that is if people don't follow instructions, we discipline them. We batter them into submission. We need to move into a culture where people do the right thing because they want to. Because they know it's the right thing. It, that's not easy. Other um, uh, other sectors have had to do that. People like construction and so on. And it is a very difficult challenge to move from this command and control style to a, a more supportive style. But we can do it. And that's how we will get our next raft of improvements in, in accident rates. And in particular, we need to banish catnip. And if anybody doesn't know what catnip is, it's the cheapest available technique not involved in prosecution. <laughs> I see far too many times people just trying to do the job as cheaply as possible as long as it doesn't break the law. Actually, we should be trying to do a good and a safe job and be known for that, not for just getting things done cheaply. Um, and this is where actually most of my time and effort is going in currently with support from the HSE. And that's on less tolerance for unsafe machinery and situations. We are getting far too much machinery. Um, that's given to us, you know, they give you the truck and they say, oh, and if you want the fisheye lens, that's extra. Oh, and if you want the reversing cameras, that's extra. And oh, if you want a sensor system on the bin lifts, that's it. Well, no, the vehicle should be safe and they should be supplying a safe vehicle. And if that means the vehicle is a bit more expensive, well, that's how it should be. We shouldn't be in a situation where they're being where we're finding machines that we're then having to overcome the default the, the, the faults with by um, training people and so on, because the reality is people don't always do what they're supposed to do. Um, and actually, we as an industry should stop buying machinery that isn't safe and fit to use. Well, to some extent, we're complicit in this. We've bought the trucks that Dennis Eagle and Heil and all the others have produced with all these safety extras, and we should simply be saying to them, no, hang on a minute. There is a standard which you should be supplying us and it should be safer at that point. So there's my that's my we are currently, as I say, with HSC, we've brought some of the manufacturers to a meeting. We've explained some of this to them. They didn't like very much our approach, uh, but HSC have a big stick and they will wield it if they have to. Um, and I think it will be better for all of us. Um, but what we do need to do is to work with them at this point so that we can work out what those adaptations are, what a safe vehicle looks like, not just rely on EM1501, which is the European standard on such things and is really, uh, it leaves out more than it puts in. So that's half an hour or so from me. Um, I'm sorry if it was a bit longer than I'd hoped, but I am here to answer any of your questions, take on any of those points uh, uh, that anybody might uh, be interested in. OK, folks, so we'll open the floor for questions. Anybody, any burning issues for Chris? Uh, I have one. Far away. Okay. Uh, it's uh, regarding lithium batteries. Uh -huh. uh, it's, it's like you were explaining about the uh, gas cylinders. They didn't know it was there. A lithium ba a battery you know, can, can start a fire and we don't know that it's there. What is the best way to put this out? I know there's um, uh, extinguishers for them, but is water the best? OK, I have a simple answer for you, but you're not going to like it. Um, lithium, lithium fires can only be put out by what's called a class D fire extinguisher. Yeah. It's, it's using a fusing powder. In order to use those, you need special training and yeah. you need to be able to use, uh, you need to have the right environment to be able to use them. They're designed for chemical factories and so on. Mm -hmm. The reality with a lithium battery fire is the best thing to do is to let it go. Let it burn and then deal with the secondary fires that it's created. By fi Lithium battery fires are short duration. They don't last very long. Mm. Uh, and generally, that's the best advice. Um, you're unlikely to get to a lithium battery fire quickly enough to be able to apply a class D fire extinguisher anyway. Uh, and actually, it's probably more danger than it's worth in order to attempt to do so. So that's currently the wish guidance on that. You'll find it in Waste 28. Um, 
the, that's the lithium batteries the are a serious the, problem. The, the, it's the same as the uh, fire, same advice the fire authority gave. Joe, you know, Chris, um, the one that's jumping out to myself there is the individual who unfortunately lost their life while they were trying to uh, depressurize a, a fire extinguisher. Mm -hmm. Now that one, you know, you know, I would imagine up and down the waste sites up and down the country, there is individuals trying to depressurize various cylinders. Yep. Has, has WISH got a, a guidance document around that or have we got one? Uh, yes, we do. Reason. We've got, yeah, um, I'm going to say waste six, but yeah, I'd have to go and check because there are so many waste documents now, I've lost the plot. Um, but there is one on disposal of gas cylinders. Um, the reality is you should be depressurizing any cylinder, whether it's a fire extinguisher or anything else, in a, a, a pressure vessel where it's designed to do that. Um, just as a by the by, there is an issue currently on N2O that you may or may not be aware of. There are 27 different fittings used for N2O. They're not manufactured by one manufacturer in China. Unfortunately, there are lots of different fittings and there is nobody in the UK currently licensed to degas N2O cylinders. The uh, only only the only people licensed are in Europe. Um, this is something we're working with the EA on because clearly these things are popping up all over the place and just quarantining them in storage areas isn't going to solve the problem. So if some of you are building up stores of N2O cylinders, uh, I can sympathize with you, but at the moment I cannot point you in a direction of an outlet uh, because I don't know of one. But please, please be reassured that um, DEFRA, EIA, HSE and others are aware of this problem uh, and are um, looking at a solution. And forgive me, Chris, but the lithium battery situation is much the same in the UK, isn't that right? In the sense that the plant is over capacity and we're now currently building up a storage of batteries around the UK. So um, the for smaller lithium batteries, there are a couple of companies in the, there are a couple of organisations in the UK to deal with the smaller ones. The big problem is EV batteries. There is no recycling facility in the UK currently for EV batteries, so electric vehicle batteries, the bigger ones. They have to go to a facility in Belgium. Uh, which is massively um, oversubscribed at the moment. And there are storage uh, storage of EV batteries all around the country and actually uh, all, all around Europe currently. So uh, I completely understand and, and think very laudable the move towards electric vehicles, but actually we need the infrastructure that supports that. Uh, we have had three cases uh, in England and Wales of EV batteries being dumped at HWRCs um, and at least two of those resulted in serious fires because an EV battery this isn't this isn't your vape battery going off it's intense yeah and it's uh, prolonged because it's got hundreds of cells in an EV battery so they go off sequentially well, I must admit that is my personal biggest concern for amenity centers and MRFs is actually the likes of the electric scooter and the electric bike batteries. I think we're going to start to see these things coming into the waste streams pretty soon. Small enough that they'll get through, but big enough to cause yep. a big issue. Uh, so it's on my radar anyway. Yeah. Anybody yeah, the, else? The, I, yeah, can you hear me? Yep, yep I'm here. Sorry, Chris. Yeah, I just had a question on the the bin lift bin lifts. Yep. Um, just as regards to the employer's responsibility, like obviously, so if we're operating like a bin collection vehicle and that's had its loader inspection, and you're talking about that there's still like possible safety issues, um, yep. that maybe aren't as obvious. Like you, know, just from a liability point of view, like if we have if the vehicles had its loader check. And it's deemed safe by insurance or whatever. And there is an but that's issue only to lift the weight. That, that's yeah. not about actually operating the machinery. It would be a more a pure check. It would be a, a provision and use of work equipment. Uh, uh, what I would suggest to you is to go to the WISH website and download the position statement. That will direct you to the guidance in info 10, I want to say. I think it's info 10. Um, if you are following that guidance mm. uh, and you have an incident, 
uh, then I think in liability terms, you will find yourself in a defensible position. If because actually it'll be it'll be the manufacturers that um, there will be proceedings against. If on the yeah. other hand, you're not telling your operatives that there is this danger and you're not doing the simple things to try and advise them on how to use the operate the, the auto bin this correctly, uh, but then I'm afraid you will be liable. Yeah, so even though obviously, yeah, I know the certain aspects that are actually lifting, but obviously like the e-stops and all that type of operating stuff is checked. But yep. um, I'm just wondering, so so we're responsible for checking. For checking. So those controls aren't positioned in the right place, even though the, the vehicle's been supplied like that, or there's still a possibility that that someone could catch a finger or whatever, then we're, we're sort of responsible under pure, yeah? It, it, you are aware of it, and I've made you aware yeah. of it. And, um, yeah. you, you will be responsible for drawing per, uh, workforce's attention to this. It's a basic risk assessment. Yeah. You, you need to assess the risk, you need to identify the risk to them, and you need to take suitable precautions to prevent, uh, to minimise that risk, which will mean telling them how to operate it, monitoring to make oh, yeah. sure they do operate it that way and so on. Yeah, uh, I, I sympathise with your position and your concern. I really do. I think this is something that the manufacturers need to address. I was but in say, the meantime, oh, we are where we are. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's fine. It's just obviously you, you have guys as trained and whatever and all. It's just, just, it was just curious, just where, um, sort of where you stand with that. But obviously, yeah, um, no, that's fine. That sort of answers my question. Yeah. Okay. No worries. Is anybody else? Sorry. To, to echo Chris's point there in, in terms of manufacturers, I, I feel the frustration of industry and I'm just thinking of a, an example is actually with conveyor guarding at the moment and return idler guarding. Um, so a lot of you potentially have had visits where we come out and you've maybe spent hundreds of thousand pounds on a brand new machine and HSE and I um, are potentially placing a prohibition notice on it because the guards at the return idler still allow hand or finger access into the in running nip points. And although it is a manufacturer's issue, the way that we also look at it is it is being used by the duty holder and the enforcement notice is served on the duty holder. And we do still then go and follow up with the manufacturer. Um, so, yeah, it's it, it's frustrating and certainly something that HSE and I are, are trying to push forward with manufacturers to, to get the equip equipment right in the first place. And you may be aware that um, all machinery nowadays comes with a CE mark. Yeah. It means mm -hmm. check everything. <laughs> Sorry if that seems a bit flippant, but actually that's my experience is you really do need to check everything. No, it's a really good point. I mean, because even with machine regarding, with all the modifications and change management, as you mentioned earlier, Chris, it does take us guys to be on our toes and even the maintenance guys to know what the standard we're looking for is. Uh, to make sure the guards are replaced and you know suitable for the job that they need them to be doing. So it's a very good point and to bring up. I mentioned to you Waste 33 and the various info sheets that go with it. There's one on conveyors, Justin, which is specifically for conveyors and has all of the uh, information about what a, a good in running nip guard looks like uh, and particularly uh, about what guarding should look like with conveyors. Often conveyors are bought separate to the machinery and then you get junctions between um, the two which aren't really the responsibility of any manufacturer, they will claim, um, but the way that it's put together. So again, that info sheet addresses that. So part of the reason why we've gone to the trouble of um, preparing Waste 33 and then all these individual sheets that go with it is, is to address the particular point that you're raising. So please don't feel you're alone. Uh, the other thing I would say to all of you is if you're having a problem, please come and ask us. If it's a problem for everybody, then we will work with the relevant bodies to get some guidance out there to protect you, to inform and educate you and to find solutions to these problems. That's what we're here for. Could I just come in on, on that point, Chris? Um, thank you very much for the presentation. And honestly, it didn't feel like half an hour it felt, or whatever. It felt like 10 minutes. Um, our, I work in Belfast City Council and our waste staff, operatives, trade unions, they're very, very engaging and always want to learn when anything, normally you hear something when it's on the news, the BBC or um, on the TV news and the guys will come in and say the one thing they keep asking about is the Coventry um, 
accident and is there any information and Obviously, a lot of these cases need investigated by the HSE and, and when the official um, line comes out, it's a t maybe two years or more has passed. So it's getting that information and, and having a point of contact. Uh, I didn't know there was a policy statement on it. It's been very, very hard to find um, information on that one. So uh, we, we'll probably share the slides if, if that's OK with you from today, if you're sure. um, going to share them with us. But yeah, just that's the one thing that the feedback from our point of view, it's the length of time it takes and our staff do want to do something and, and want to look at the issues now. How can this be prevented from you know, happening tomorrow? OK, um, we operate a system where uh, with we share a, a database with HSE. Um, if there are fatalities that either one of us know about, then we'll put them on the database and both will investigate. Um, we, if you want to, if you hear something on the news and you want to know more, come and talk to us, write, send me an email or ring me. Okay. okay. And we will tell you what we can tell you. The only thing I will have to say to you, however, is there are occasions where you have to respect the, investig the investigative process and we simply yeah. can't say. Yeah. What we try to do, however, is to extract um, uh, the, the important points, which won't affect the prosecution in any way, shape, size or form, but simply say, these are the facts this is what we would and this is where we would point you the position statement for example is endorsed by hse as is all our guidance so if you're interested in what our response was as a result of coventry that's there for you to see okay thank you that's just most helpful thank you yeah. well I'm pleased to help i mean that's what like i said Wish is a bunch of volunteers. None of us gets paid for doing this, but we are here. Uh, we are the industry trying to help itself. And it, it, we can only help you if you contribute and, and take part uh, and help yourselves. Yep, Chris, thank you very much indeed. Not only for your My time, pleasure. your expertise and your knowledge and your willingness to share and help us great. Anybody else has any questions? Sure, you can get in touch with us and we'll pass the question on to Chris for you. Yeah, please do. That'd be fun. Yep. Thank you so much indeed. All right, ju Justine, don't be going away. <laughs> uh, have you a wee update for us? Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, right. I'm trying to share my screen, so let me know whether you can see it or not. Yeah, I can see it there, okay. Yep. See it all right now. Um, well, folks, I uh, will give you a bit of a brief update for anyone who's new to introduce myself. My name is Justine McIntyre um, and I'm an inspector in HSE and I in the explosives extractive industries and waste groups. So we have responsibility for inspections um, and enforcement at private waste premises. And in terms of public sector, we have a public sector team in HSE and I who deal at Deal with those premises. So whenever we have these meetings, usually I give a bit of an update in terms of what our incident stats are um, and any initiatives that we're currently running at the moment. Um, what we've just heard in Chris's presentation um, is, is quite shocking, um, that number of fatalities um, in such a short period of time. And I guess really that's sort of the collective objective of all of us being here together is to put measures in place to prevent those from happening. Um, the picture in Northern Ireland at the moment, um, the last update that I gave you was on the 26th of June. So the figures presented in front of you are the ridors which have come through from the 28th of June to date, well, to yesterday. So we've had three over three day injuries in terms of slip strips and falls um, for manual handling. Um, we've had one person struck by a falling bin. Um, one person suffered a strain whenever the vehicle that they were operating collided with another vehicle. Um, we have had two eye injuries and one cut. Uh, in terms of major injuries, then we have had um, touch with just one major injury um, from June. And that was a fracture um, to an ankle whenever they were just in a vehicle cab. So these injuries about people getting in and out of vehicle cabs keep coming up time and time again. Um, such a relatively straightforward thing that people are doing, um, but they're causing lost time and causing major injuries to be reported. 
In terms of ongoing investigations, um, we have one fatal incident which occurred back in January 2022 um, with our major investigation team that was involving workplace transport. And we have one major injury investigation ongoing with our MIT team, and that is to do with contact with moving machinery. Um, so you can see, um, like Chris's presentation and the picture in uh, GB, the picture over here is quite similar in that the more major incidents um, which are going on for further investigation and potential prosecutions are involving things like workplace transport and contact with moving machinery. Um, I am happy to report, and long may this stay the same, that in 2023 we have not had uh, any fatalities in the waste industry in Northern Ireland, um, which is a positive thing. So uh, let's, you know, keep up the efforts and, and keep those stats the same. So in terms of initiatives that we have been doing, you'll be very aware um, that in 2022 um, and in 2023, we have been running a workplace transport inspection campaign um, across the private waste sector. So just in terms of some figures, um, in 2023, our group um, has completed a further 20 workplace transport inspections of private waste premises. So the total then between 22 and 23 is that we have completed 45 inspections um, of the waste sector here. And that, that's just private sector, public sector are separate. Um, as you know, then our group also look at quarries and concrete as well. Um, so between 22 to 23, collectively, our group have went out now and done 110 workplace transport inspections. Um, and anyone who's had an inspection from us um, will know that they are quite detailed and, you know, depending on the size of the site, they can be quite long, you know, a four or a five hour inspection. Um, so we certainly have got value out of those and hope that the industry have got value out of those as well. And my personal view is that there has been great value in this. Um, and I say that through the improvements and the improved standard um, of management of workplace transport risk on site that we have seen as a result. Now, in the latest inspection campaign, in terms of uh, any enforcement, um, we serve four prohibition notices um, in our 2023 campaign. So two of these were issued with regard to unsafe vehicles. So these were uh, they were actually two grabs at a scrap metal site um, which had undergone lower examination. However, there were safety critical defects found on both of the grabs and the grabs were in use at the time of the inspection. Um, so if you get a lower examination and there's safety critical defects, that machine needs to be parked up. The repairs need to be done before it's brought back into the operation and you should be getting it rechecked is the message. We had two further prohibition notices issued then in terms of unguarded machinery. So again, not related to workplace transport, but of course, if we're out on site doing a specific thing and we come across something else unsafe, of course, we're going to react um, and take the necessary measures. We issued four improvement notices and um, one of those was for inadequate measures on site in terms of vehicle pedestrian segregation. Um, and the other three improvement notices I haven't listed here, but I am aware that they were all with regard to not having uh, loader examination completed for lifting equipment. So the positive, um, although I'm talking about enforcement, is the number of notices that we have served in 23 in the waste industry has come down from 2022 um, inspection campaign, where there was two prohibition notices and 10 improvement notices. Um, and everyone will be aware then that certainly HSE and I have a new corporate plan for the next five years. So from April there, we are in year one. And year one, the focus across all HSE and I groups will be on workplace transport. So the one thing that I'll say is, although we have as a group completed our specific workplace, workplace transport initiative, um, workplace transport is going to be a standing item and something that we'll look at on any inspection. So whatever reason we have to come and visit your site, um, we will, you know, one way or the other, end up looking at your workplace transport controls. So I understand that inspections of the public sector waste premises are ongoing at present um, with the HSE and I public sector team as well. 
Um, just a few images here to show you. Um, up on the top left, um, that's just a snapshot from our website. Um, the campaign has been given the slogan Drive Danger Out. So you will see an awful lot of stuff on HSA and I social media, um, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter um, over the coming year. Um, I want to thank anyone who is here today who actually came um, to one of the, the local events and supported the launch of the campaign in September. Um, as Jennifer was saying earlier on, what we did was the, the pop-up billboard went round to basically every council um, in Northern Ireland and we invited um, representatives um, from each industry and then we had mayors, um, Lord Mayors, etc. come along to support it as well. So you can actually see uh, Jennifer Stevens, um, our uh, vice chair in the, the image on the bottom left. In terms of the results of the 2022 Workplace Transport Initiative, what we did was we developed an actual feedback sheet um, that was distributed through Wish NI and it's available on our website. And that is an image of it on the right hand side there. We have only just finished our waste workplace transport inspections for this year. So the intention is that we will now collate results and we will develop a further feedback sheet and that will be in a similar format as last year. So we will indicate where we have seen good controls and then we will indicate where we feel that there are opportunities um, for improvement. So I would like to think that that document should be available within the next three to four weeks. Um, whenever it is, it'll be put on the website and I will certainly make sure I get it distributed um, through Wish NI. If I could direct you then um, to our YouTube, um, a lot of you may have already seen the TV adverts um, for the Drive Danger Out campaign. There is also radio adverts. Um, I think they're highly effective. Um, so please do go um, on to youtube.com and it's forward slash at HSENI video. Um, I will also direct you to HSENI website um, where we have campaign web pages which will actually uh, link you to an awful lot of resources which will uh, help you um, moving forward. The other thing to mention is um, our comms team are currently working on publishing uh, a very specific guidance uh, resource list for the waste industry in Northern Ireland, which will have links to all different pieces of guidance. Um, that should be completed in the next two weeks. Um, and I also want to extend my thanks to Chris Jones um, from uh, Wish GB, um, who provided some guidance um, and resources which have actually been included on that resource list as well. So that's something that we will get sent out to you via email. So, yep, I've already said those things. Resource lists will be uh, available in October 2023 and also the feedback leaflet um, will be published um, hopefully by the end of the month, sort of middle of November. Um, as a more good news story then, I just want to share some images with you then of different things that we have seen whenever we're out and about. And you'll notice some of these might have a sort of concrete or a quarry setting, but they're things that are applicable and can be used uh, on your sites potentially as well. So we've seen good and much improved practice in terms of vehicle pedestrian segregation, in particular putting in pedestrian walkways um, and physically protected walkways where possible rather than line markings. It's very easy for vehicles to go over line markings. Um, within the waste industry, you will know how quickly and how easily they end up being scraped off the ground with the amount of vehicle movements. So something more physical and permanent um, will always take preference. So you can see here, um, they've used post and chain here. They've used simple concrete blocks um, to direct uh, pedestrians around site. Here's another couple of good examples, um, a fence around the perimeter of the building to keep pedestrians separate from the main vehicle route up and down site. And this is another thing that we've been encouraging as well. So on the picture on the right, the door is obviously the pedestrian entrance. Um, and on many sites, people end up walking in and out of roller doors. The roller doors are there for vehicles to come in and out of, but actually putting up this fence beside the door will then make a person stop whenever they come out and not walk straight out onto traffic and, and direct them really to the right way into the building. 
Um, another simple and effective thing um, doesn't take up an awful lot of room and is not extremely costly is the use of crash barriers as well around site to actually demarcate walkways um, and then pedestrian crossings um, and good line markings where, where applicable. Obviously, you can't put physical barriers across a main vehicle route um, where you're crossing from one place to another. So it's being sensible about it, you know, and doing what is reasonably practicable. Um, at crossing points as well, one of the things that uh, we've been pushing and the industry have really took up on is actually using, these are like spring loaded gates. So essentially at the point where the person is going to cross from one side of the road to the other, this little simple gate is there to get the person to stop, take a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds, sorry, not a couple of minutes and look right and left and just pause before they walk straight out. Um, and it, it, they do make a difference. Again, another couple of photos here, um, the gates at the crossing point, and then that is an example there of a good walkway um, that is completely enclosed in um, by Harris fencing. Um, this was a good observation I actually see on the site, and this is in relation to having good control of who's actually coming on to your premises. So this is a turnstile gate at a premises. Um, and what they have is they basically have a key fob system. So nobody can actually get past or onto the site on foot um, without having one of these fobs um, and getting through this gate. And then in terms of vehicles, um, they also have a barrier system in place too. So it's prevent, you know, preventing people um, and members of the public from getting on to your site um, and being close to vehicles and close to where work activities um, are taking place. Um, this image then down on the bottom left, um, you'll maybe vaguely see a bit of a green light on top of the vehicle. Um, one of the items on our inspection um, was making sure that people are wearing um, lap belts um, and their seat belts um, where they're fitted. This green light then, whenever the person gets into the loading shovel, um, lights up green whenever it's on. Um, so good way of checking and making sure. Um, and then this is another thing that I've seen on site on the right hand side and it's to do with um, training and competence. So everything on site, every item of plant has an asset register. You'll see the sign there on the side of the vehicle saying train staff only, but obviously I have covered up the names um, for GDPR purposes, but there is actually a list then of people who are trained and authorised to use that item of plant and that was the same for every item of plant across the site. In terms of plant being safe or unsafe to operate, um, one of our inspectors um, took photographs of this uh, good practice out on site. Um, you will see the picture on the left hand side where the vehicle is safe to operate. It has a little green tag with a tick on it, whereas unsafe to operate, you can then go and fit a stop danger do not operate tag. Um, so basically just to make sure if that a machine has any sort of safety critical defects, it's under repair, um, that nobody gets into it um, and it potentially causes an incident. Um, this is an example then of a loading um, uh, unloading uh, platform. So basically this is for sort of flatbeds. Um, obviously we have actually had a few red ores of people coming off flatbed lorries whenever they're strapping down loads or, or sort of walking along the bed of the lorry. This system here, the lorry drives up, um, the metal plates there um, will actually then come up and sit on top of the, of the bed of the lorry. The person will then walk up these steps, they are wearing a harness, and then they can clip into this horizontal lifeline, which is fitted at the top. And they can walk onto the flatbed of the lorry, but they are restricted then on how far they can actually travel. So they can't go to the very edge of it. So this system is in place basically to prevent falls from heights whenever they're working on flatbed lorries. Um, and then general demarcation around a site as well. Um, we've seen a lot of sites now with specific marked out loading um, and unloading areas. Um, and one of the areas which is positive um, and I welcome is that a lot of sites have implemented sort of areas for small load customers or small vehicles to come and, you know, tip waste, load or unload. 
separate from all the rest of the high risk activities uh, and large vehicles um, and work activities going on around the rest of the site. So now that the workplace transport um, initiative for our group um, is almost really now at completion, um, we're looking forward and moving on to the next campaign. Um, and that will be on machinery guarding safe isolation and maintenance. So again, as a group, we're running this for the three sectors that we look after. So concrete, quarries and waste. Um, and we're actually kicking off with concrete sites. So waste um, is the final sector that we will be looking at in terms of this initiative. So it will give you a bit of an opportunity um, to maybe carry out a bit of an audit or review at your site, um, look at your isolation and lockout procedures, look at your risk assessments for maintenance, for routine maintenance, for non-routine maintenance um, and get yourselves in order. Um, on the 11th of December, um, HSE and I will be issuing a press release um, to announce the commencement of this initiative in the private waste industry. And our inspectors will be out starting these inspections from the 15th of January 2024. And what we're going to do, um, similar to last time, is we will actually share the inspection pro forma with you. And what I have offered to Wish and I, um, and we'll get a date in the diary, is I will come on in December and deliver a bit of an online presentation. And for anyone who wants to attend, I will go through that inspection pro forma step by step. And I'll detail out to you what our expectations are whenever we come out on site. That's to be completely transparent um, about what we'll be looking at, um, what our expectations are. And you have in the pro forma around a month before we potentially come to your site, we'll give you a chance to actually review your own procedures um, yourself. If you want to get a bit more of an idea or a heads up of how that's going to look like um, this Monday, um, we will be issuing a press release for the commencement of this initiative in the concrete industry and the pro forma for the concrete industry will be shared then. Um, the waste one isn't going to be massively dissimilar. However, obviously, with you know specific items of equipment, balers, shredders, trommels, etc., um, which will feature on the inspection pro forma. Uh, and another thing then that we have done is we have now actually prepared an information sheet um, for industry. So it'll work for quarries, for waste and for concrete. That is also coming out this Monday on the 23rd of October. And the whole focus of that is on guarding return idlers because um, that has been a pressing issue. And almost every inspection um, that we go to, we're, we're given advice on how to extend guards or, or change guards. So this will show you what is, is acceptable and what isn't acceptable. So folks, that is the end of, of my update for today. Has okay, anyone, any, anyone any questions for me? Um, I suppose one, you mentioned the, uh, the event in December to, to review the pro forma. Um, yeah. I wonder how will that be communicated? Will that come through WISH to be able to figure out attendance? Yes, I'm hoping that we can do that in collaboration with WISH, of course. Um, so, you know, if we can potentially get a date in the diary for December, my offer is there um, and open to come on and spend, you know, sort of a session kind of dedicated to the next initiative um, and giving advice on that. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Justine. It's Golda Burrows here from Plant and Civil Engineer magazine. Um, just with you saying about the guidelines and the press releases that you're going to be sending out for the concrete, the quarry and the waste um, sectors, are you able to fire those um, press releases over to me for me to include into the publication? Yes, uh -huh. so, well, certainly any other promotion that we can get to spread the message is, is always welcomed. Um, so, Golda, yeah. I will. I that will. Stick, is, that, is that for all industries you would be looking at then, not just waste? So you're interested in concrete and quarries as well, yeah? Absolutely. We, we do the quarry journal for the Empanai Association here in Northern oh, Ireland. For yeah. Mineral products, yeah. Yeah, we do that for Gordon Best and, and he has a page in the publication and we do have a quarry section of the magazine as well as the waste and recycling and we do concrete features. So it's all relevant for the magazine. 
Yeah, no, I, I send the stuff across to you, Golda, and thank you for that, because anything that we can do to promote it um, and make people aware. And also, um, if I can, just going forward to, I don't know if it's Jim or if it's David, for me to sort of start up a Wish and I page as well, just sort of educate everybody on the waste side so that there is continuity in every issue going forward um, for the waste um, companies to read in the magazine. Great minds, think I like Gola. Just writing a wee note here that says contact Gola. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, Jim. You, well, you and I can can chat about that then. Yeah, first class. Thank you very much. Topics we can we can cover going forward. Good show. All right. Brilliant. That's all I wanted to add there. Thank you. Thanks, Golden. Any other questions for Justine? Yeah, Justine, well, well Owens here um, from CES. Hi, um the 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 twenty third that's Monday coming up then for the pro forma for the concrete premises and the quarries. That's right. Con yeah. Concrete. Yeah. How, how do we can we link in with you that or what way do we get that information? So in terms of the the first um, machinery um, guarding safe isolation and maintenance initiative we're running will be for the concrete sector. So the yeah. press release on Monday will be specifically for them. Um, I will be sharing um, the press release and the pro forma with Gordon um, at MPANI um, for right. inclusion on this Friday's newsletter. The press release will come out from HSE and I on Monday. And in yep. the press release, there will be links to the inspection pro forma. Um, we also will have a link to this new information sheet on guarding return idlers. And we have a further information sheet on uh, advice on the cleaning procedures for the interior of truck mounted mixers as well going on the press release. Yeah. And it, it'll be the same format then for each industry. Um, so after concrete um, in a month's time, we'll then be releasing it for quarries. Um, and then, as I say, in December, it will be for waste. And then we'll commence uh, the waste inspections in January 2024. Yeah. So how how do I get that information on Monday then? Do I just uh, I, I can I subscribe to that, or is there a way I can link in with that? <laughs> um, if you go onto the HSE and I website on Monday, um, it should be at the top of the news. If yeah. if everything's done the way, <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping. Yeah. No worries. And and William, if you don't get it, um, just call me or email me, and I'll get yeah. it to you. No problem at all. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Anybody else or any other any anything just occurred to you that you want to ask Chris as well? We all good. Well, just to mention that we're working with the students down at the University of Ulster, and the student ambassador award is in the offing. But this year it is actually based on accident investigations. And investigating and actually uh, trying to investigate a, a real accident. So that's slightly different for the student ambassadors in this year. Next year, we're already looking ahead to trying to put together a safety and health awareness day. And there'll be more information on that to follow. And hopefully by next year, we'll be able to go out live with ambassador awards again. So, David, Jennifer, Justin, is there anything else that I have forgotten? No, I think that's everything from the agenda. I suppose the last thing really is just an open forum. If anybody has any health and safety issues or concerns or any items or aspects that they think that we should be looking at, that they want to put on our radar for what's coming down the track. So open forum for anyone who wants to raise any health and safety issues. No, well, look, if anybody doesn't feel comfortable talking publicly and, and nearly wants to reach out behind the scenes, feel free to send an email to the Wish NI email address or one of the team members and we'll, we'll certainly get a look at it too, we can. I think the chat box is live there as well. So if anyone even wants to add anything to the chat box after the meeting for um, future topics for future Wish um, events, and uh, we've been holding the events both in person and online, and I think both work in, in different ways. So um, even any thoughts, opinions on that, um, anything about the, the Wish and I uh, forum, uh, work away through whatever means um, is best for you.
and the, our email addresses are all there. And we're on LinkedIn and we'll have the web page and the um, obviously this chat box here. Can I just say thanks again for um, inviting me and uh, I look forward to it. It's been really interesting. Uh, some stuff I'll take back uh, and uh, look forward really to working with you again in the future. If you need an update on anything, please don't hesitate to, to ask and I'll happily come along again. Well, thank you, Chris. Thank Much you. Appreciate it. Good to see you again, Chris. <laughs> nice to see you, Jim. Folks, that, that's us for today. So thank you all for signing in. And as we were saying, you know, if you have any questions, do try to get in touch with us by all those various means. Just don't look for me on Facebook, Twitter or anything else. <laughs> Apart Thanks, from everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.